Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Anastasia Volovich to give today's uh, theoretical physics seminar. She's going to tell us uh, about n equals four Yang Mills amplitudes, symbol alphabet, cluster algebras, and clabic graphs. Uh, lots to uh, take in there, and uh, it's a great. We welcome her virtually from Brown University. Thanks, uh, Anastasia, for uh, for joining us, and you may proceed. All right. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, it's a great uh, to uh, uh, be here virtually, and thank you so much for inviting me. So I will um, tell you a little bit about the recent progress in uh, n equals four Young Mills theory um, amplitudes. Uh, so I did indeed put three of those words here. These are some of the important ingredients that uh, will come into the play and hopefully I'll explain each one of them for you uh, here in this talk. So the first part of my talk will mostly consist of the review and then towards the end, I'll tell you a little bit about um, more recent work. Uh, so this is based on these two papers plus actually two papers to appear. So this is the work done with um, uh, so my current student, Jorge Margo, my uh, former student, Anders Schreiber, who is now in Oxford, uh, he just started and um, so uh, he had to move during uh, the COVID. Then Mark uh, Spradlin, uh, who is a professor at Brown, and uh, Akshay uh, Yelishburg, who is a postdoc at Brown. He just joined us. Uh, he used to be a, a student of Nimar Kanihamer at Princeton. And then as a beginning new student, uh, Li Chiang Reng. So there's be some work in progress with uh, him as well. All right, so uh, let, let me begin now. Okay, yes. So here's the outline of my talk. So uh, I'm gonna start by uh, trying to uh, give like some motivation and introduction. Why, what is that we're computing? Why are we interested in? What's what has the progress been? And then I'm gonna slowly, so, so we would be looking at the scattering amplitudes and I will be slowly increasing the number of points. So uh, I'll start in, in general telling you about how do we, uh, using mod modern methods, how do we currently compute these endpoints uh, amplitudes? And then I'll start explaining their mathematical structure. So I'll try to explain, introduce the cluster algebras, what the, what uh, the structure uh, there is. And then I'll um, tell you that uh, essentially six and seven point amplitudes are very well understood. But starting at seven points, new problems arise. And I will explain to you what these are and uh, some of the techniques that's been developed in the last year to solve these issues. And then I'll explain to you um, uh, the results from our paper uh, and so-called flabby graph methods. So, and then I'll conclude. So let me just um, start with, uh, so number one, the introduction. Okay, so we, what are we looking at? Uh, as you very well know, uh, scattering amplitudes uh, encode the process of uh, particle interactions. You know, they determine the probabilities of various outcomes. So we have some particles coming in, they interact, and some particles uh, come out. And we would like to compute the probabilities of these various outcomes. Now, how do we compute those? Well, we uh, learn in quantum field theory class that they're normally computed by Feynman diagrams. So, you know, we have, you know, an Einstein model, or you know, you take your favorite quantum field theory. We have a Lagrangian, and we have uh, you know the corresponding interactions. And for each vertex, we for each interaction we draw a vertex. So here I have the quark and gluon vertex. So gluon, gluon, and uh, uh, so three gluon and four gluon vertices as uh, written here. And then, you know, if we are interested in say given number of incoming particles and given number of loops, we just draw various uh, topologically, you know, an equivalent uh, diagrams and each for each diagrams as a corresponding contribution. So we use uh, Feynman rules for that. So very simple and, you know, this is what uh, we learn when we start uh, learning quantum field theory. And it's all great until we actually start computing. So there are a number of, you know, so we start, uh, so for example, four point three level amplitude would be in, uh, you know, in Peskin Schroeder in a quantum field theory book. But if you start going, increasing the number of legs, for example, if you go to five point three level amplitude, it already, you know, if you write down your amplitude um, as a function of a momentum and helicity, it takes 
uh, like a 25 pages of the form that I've written. Or for example, if you start going you know, to loop level with Feynman diagrams, and if you look at uh, six particle amplitudes at one loop, you know, the, the number of diagrams uh, start growing and the, each contribution takes some, uh, some uh, non-trivial amount of work. And then of course we have also to do the integrals. So for example, here I've drawn some of the higher loop integrals just for four points. So there are two things we have to do integrals, uh, then we have to draw those diagrams, they, they, they grow. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an important problem to, to be able to compute these amplitudes um, analytically, because of course these enter as a building block into any um, calculation that we see in, you know, in, in, in experiments. So this is important uh, to have an analytic handle on to those results. So um, as I've Try to show you in some of these slides. Yes, this this takes some, uh, you know, to, to draw those diagrams, you know, takes some work. And what we would like to do is we'd like to develop methods to tackle these computations. And uh, I'd say in the past uh, twenty years, uh, this grew, this grew into a field uh, called, you know, so sometimes called uh, amplitude program, where people do uh, you know develop methods and use you know insights from you know string theory from mathematics from uh, uh you know whatnot to to tackle these computations so let me just give you for example a very well known example so as you might know and i'm not going to explain uh, this part here so for example uh, if you just look at the five point um amplitude uh at tree level uh it turns out that if you use clever variables, again, I'm, I'm not going to explain this part, but I will explain um, you know, further um, the things that I will be actually talking about. So it turns out if you if you if you look, if you use clever variables such as so-called spin helicity variables, all those 25 pages uh, collapse to the expression in the box. And this is what's known a park tail amplitude, and it was written first in in, in the uh, 1980s by Park and Taylor. And so, so this is a well-known, you know, uh, result from, and, and this is a kind of thing that, that we, are, we are looking at. Or for example, using, again, I'm not explaining um, this part again. So you, the, for the one loop six particle amplitude, one can write a compact expression um, consisting of only, you know, uh, one kind of integral with maybe various permutations that I've drawn, um, but I didn't draw, but I did uh, try to indicate uh, in this page. So uh, the upshot is that, so there is this amplitude program. So what we are doing here, and I'll be precise as what I, what part of this I'm working on. So we would like to explore uh, so, so number one is that we would like to explore these uh, mathematical structures in amplitude. So if, if we know that, for example, a long formula, when we write it as a function of spin and helicity, uh, collapses to something simple, there got to be some structure. There's, there's got to be some hidden mathematical structure, and we'd like to understand it. On the other hand, we would like to exploit this structure. And uh, so the better we understand the variables or the structure or the algebra behind it, the better, the, the more progress we can make actually computing these amplitudes. And, um, you know, there, there's like certain, um, there would be like some state of the art. Okay, we, we can compute this particular amplitude, but when we come up with a new technique, we can make progress. So not only we can, you know, trivially rederive all the previous formulas, we uh, we always would like to go, you know, a step further and compute something that we're not able to compute before. So this is the, the so-called amplitudes program. And, you know, we have like um, a weekly, um, sorry, not weekly, a yearly meeting. Uh, and in fact, we did have one in Dublin in 2019 that maybe uh, some of you knew. So um, uh, th there may be, you know, I don't know, 100, maybe 50 people participated in this conference. So. Um, so the, the, this is just I'm trying to, to say like more general what what is what are the goals of these amplitudes program. So now I'd like to just state for you the status 
for this of these computations for n equals four plain and young mills theory. But before I do that, are there any questions? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think we're okay for the moment. Yes, you said that there'll be questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, there there would be, but you're introducing the subject. I think many people might have heard some variants of the introduction okay. already. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, very good. So okay. So let me just so so these were just general things about the program. Uh, now okay. So now let's uh, let me just state in one slide uh, about the what is the stat. So we can ask a question: what, Where do we stand on the computations of planar? n equals four uh, young males theory. So why n equals four? Well, there are many reasons why we love n equals four. It's simpler, it's uh, super symmetric, it has super conformal symmetry, it has dual conformal symmetry. It's just this, you know, some people even go as far as saying this is the harmonic oscillator of the 21st century. So it is, it, it, does, ha it does have more symmetries that, than, um, you know, than, than other theories. So a lot of progress has been made in this in this theory. And of course, we know through ADS CFT, it's also dual to the string theory in ADS space. So a lot of work has been done in the past 20 years um, on this theory. So where do we stand? So so let's let's see. Um, I don't I don't have the like kind of maybe I should have uh, kind of with years and names, but okay, so if we start. So, so these amplitudes are characterized by uh, the number L, which is the number of loops, number N, which is the number of points, and K, which is uh, the number of, uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a helicity. So we label each gluon plus or minus. The amplitude with two negative helicity gluons, two, two, two minuses or pluses called MHV. The one with three minuses called NMHV. So K equals one and the, uh, you know, and four negative helicity gluons and square MHV and et cetera, et cetera. So that explains the K for you. So for the tree, so we start with a tree level and one loop. So these are known for all N and all K. And uh, so important, some of them maybe I should highlight the tree level, for example, BCFW recursion relations were written in 2005, which, uh, you know, recursively, you can just go ahead and, and, and compute these. If you want a formula, you, there are computer codes, who can do it? Uh, okay, so uh, so that's as far as zero, um, as far as tree level and one loop goes. So for two loops, uh, what's the status? So for two loops in two, uh, yeah, I, I should have had all this by um, with, with with precise references. But uh, for two loops, there were, there was paper by uh, Simon Caron who wrote in two thousand ten, where he wrote a formula for all n and uh, all n point MHV. Then we go uh, further, uh, so we can go further in N. And uh, here, so the situation is that for um, four and five points, uh, due to some symmetries, you can write down an all L loop formula. This is called, called BDS uh, formula, kind of formula, due, because it's due to dual, uh, dual conformal symmetry, you can write just an, as an exponent of one loop amplitude. So interesting things start happening at six. And that's why, you know, you, you'll hear a lot about six, seven, and, and then hopefully eight. So uh, for seven point amplitudes, uh, they are known through four loops. And for six points, they're known through seven loops. So there's a most recent review on this subject. Uh, this is, uh, I, I mentioned this, um, uh, 2005, 07735. I wish I had a points. I don't have, a, I don't know how to use it. Can you see my, my mouse? We can see your mouse, yes. Ah, okay, so perfect. Yeah, so this is the, excellent. Yeah. This is the review. Uh, which, uh, you know, describes uh, the, the technique and states um, these results. So most notably, these were done, this have been done in the past uh, 10 years by uh, Dixon and, Alain's Dixon and collaborators. And um, I have... Um, Sorry, list. Anastasia, can, can I ask, when you say L loops, uh, uh, all four and five point, you just mean MHV? Yeah, for the, five points, it's only MHV, right? So it's only MHV. Only, yeah, minus, okay. minus, plus, 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 and then the conjugate would be minus, 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 plus, plus. So that's that's a um, MHV bar. Right. Yeah. So so only zero and one loop are known for a significant number of uh, uh, in K next leading 
Yes, that's right. Okay. So for six point, so so k is equal to one. So for six point, you have mm, you have uh, two. So, so you have MHV. So two two minuses. Then you can have three minuses. So that's n MHV. And then for seven, you can have uh, you know n MHV and, and n square MHV. That's a conjugate of. Um, so so basically, it's MHV and n MHV for six and seven points. That's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, okay, so so that's the status. Now let me just tell you. Oops, I, I can go to the next page. So for some reason I cannot now go to the next page line. I know like this. Okay, now I do. Okay, so uh, how are these computed? So um, so normally, of course, in you know how do we compute them? You know, in a quantum text, uh, a quantum field theory textbook. So we would have an amplitude, then, you know, we have the integrand, like something like this for four points, and then we integrate the loop momenta. And normally these integrals are hard, and this is not how uh, these computations are done in uh, this theory. So instead, so what are the methods and how, uh, how does Dixon at all, how do they compute these? Well, they use something called an amplitude bootstrap. So of course, uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, so um, I, I will come to that in a moment and say what's new now that was not known before. So uh, the main idea is the following. The main idea of the bootstrap uh, is to think of an amplitude as a function, some function of some variables. And then, uh, so use as much as possible information about the variables to, and then information about the function and some physical constraints to basically um, constrain the function. And I, I will be, be a little bit more precise on the next slide. So, so what you do, you start with a kind of an ansatz. You, you I, 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 again, I, I will say what, what the starting point is. And then you impose physical constraint and then you get some you know, large linear system that you then are able to solve. And you know, they've explored different um, physical and mathematical properties of these functions. And uh, that's how they were able to go to, uh, to such a uh, higher number of loops. Now, of course, the idea is not new. So let me emphasize uh, here. So you know, there's a, a famous book, the analytic uh, S matrix, for example. And it's a, you know it's a program has been a program in the '60s to be able to construct scattering amplitudes based on uh, you know few physical principles and trying to understand the analytic structure. So I, I'd like to highlight these uh, three uh, kind of main uh, new ingredients. Why this is new? Why it's good to look at it again? So first of all, uh, this is all we're going to talk about n equals four Yang-Mills theory. Uh, number two is uh, we're going to be using momentum twisters. This is something. This, this, this these are kinematic invariants that were introduced by uh, Penrose. And uh, then when it comes to function, we I will tell you something about. Um, so, so the way we're going to think about this function, I will be more precise uh, shortly, is uh, this uh, notion of a symbol. So we will be constraining the symbol again. I momentarily will be explaining it what that is. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, I think I'm going to move to part two. So that's the stat. So so recall this is um, so this was kind of the introduction, and um, I am going now to uh, tell you a little bit more about. So I'll start with an example of a n equals four Young Mills theory amplitude and uh, it's kind of walk you through the various terminology and various things that are being used in this bootstrap program. Okay, so let me start with two loop six point MHV. So as I said, you know, four and five points, we, um, uh, so we have uh, very good control. So let me just go slowly uh, and, and start with this uh, one example, you know, from, many years ago. So if you just start computing this uh, using um, uh, five integrals, these are the set of integrals that you have to do. And you know, we first did it numerically in, um, in, this, in this paper right here. Uh, then uh, using some other variables, all of these integrals could be rewritten into some other integral that I underlined uh, here. And so, so the various representations for this, for this um, uh, MHV amplitude. And uh, in particular, 
uh, we use some, some representation due to the Duca, Dura, and Smirnov. And these are really, so, so, so they actually sat down and computed the integrals. And so, so this, this is kind of the start of this whole bootstrap program. So they, they sat down and they compute this hard integrals and uh, the integrals took a seven, 17 pages of uh, very complicated um, special functions, some polylope functions. And uh, our important realization from 10 years ago, over 10 years ago in the paper with uh, uh, Goncher, Ospral and Regu was that it turns out that for two loop six point MHP formula, uh, MHP amplitude, you can write a very, very simple formula, which I wrote right here. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to, so, 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 so again, they repeat two loop six point MHP. The whole amplitude is given by the form, this formula in, the, so, so, so um, in, 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 in uh, blue. So what I will now try to explain is what, what is, um, so, so what, what are the functions? And then I try to generalize it for high end and what are the arguments, what are these brackets? Okay, so what kind of, so first, what kind of function? So we're looking at this um, L loop, Amplitudes. So it turns out that n equals four Young Mills theory have very special properties. So it turns out that the functions we get are uh, always have uniform transcendentality. So what does it mean by transcendentality? So transcendentality means, for example, transcendentality L would be like log pi to the L or polylog li l. -I -L. So what's the polylog? Polylog, I just wrote the definitions. So, you know, you have the normal log uh, and you can define Li1 as the formula uh, right here. Uh, okay, and then, um, uh, and then uh, recursively you can uh, define Lin by, by this recursive definition. So these are ordinary polylogs. So Li4, would be something defined by uh, this formula from Li3, Li3 defined from Li2, and Li2 defined from log. So the, 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 you kind of have this iterated integrals to, to define them. So, so that's, uh, what, where did it go? Okay. That is this uh, Li4, that's a polylog function. Uh, so more generally, you could have more generalized polylogs. Sometimes they're called uh, Goncharov polylogs. That's where instead of this T here, I could have T minus some uh, numbers, A1 through AL. And then more generally, in fact, starting at some, it's known that starting at some high number of points, there's something called elliptic polylogs. And there's been some progress on that. Uh, I should probably have citations, but I, I, um, I don't. I apologize, uh, but that's also a separate subject that has been investigated, but we're not going to go yet to such a high uh, end. And so, so we're not gonna be talking about uh, these elliptic uh, polylogs yet. Okay, so finally we get to symbol. Okay, so these, these are the general, general, generally some polylog functions. What is the symbol? So uh, the idea is the following. So given, given so I'm trying to define the symbol. So, Given a transcendentality one, say function, given a log, for function log r, the symbol is just r. For, um, for uh, li2 of r, the symbol is one minus r tensor r. Okay, so let's take this as definition. I'll generalize it recursively on the next slide for any li, for any polylog function. So, so it, it is, kind of like derivative, but except it's kind of smarter. So it's a map from uh, a function to some kind of tensor product. So now why is this useful? So, so this was first introduced by Goncharov and um, why is this useful? So it turns out that uh, this symbol lets one really simplify a lot of, so, so, this, so this polylog functions, they obey a lot of identities. And it turns out that, uh, for example, there's a five term Abel identity, or for example, there's an identity that I've written here. It turns out that some of these identities can be very easily derived and understood from the notion of a symbol. So for example, let's look at um, this identity right here. So if I write down the symbol of Li2, that's right here by the definition, then I write here the symbol of Li2 uh, minus X, that's right here. 
Then I didn't write it, but the symbol are based certain properties that, which are, you can see from the next page. If, if you put these two together, that's actually a, you know one minus x times one plus x. You can write it as one minus x squared times their x. And then this in turn could be turned into uh, one half, one minus x squared times the x squared. But that's nothing but the symbol of one half Li2 of x squared. So as you see in this simple example, you can use the symbol to uh, get control over uh, these uh, identities for, for polylogs. So that's why it's very useful. So what we've done actually in, uh, in this uh, work uh, 10 years ago, so we took this long formula of this horrible, horrendous polylogs and we took a symbol of it. And the symbol turned to be very simple. And then we guessed a different function such that it has the same symbol. And then numerically checked that that agrees. So in general, that's, that's why um, symbol is useful. And it's been used uh, now by now in many papers uh, to do actual uh, you know, QCD computations because you know, these, kind, these polylogs, they appear anytime you do the integral. So that's the symbol. Now for more general, so what, what so happens- just to, mm -hmm. to, to understand, the uh, this looks like it has some el element of a co-product associated with it. Yeah, and uh, these yeah. are the types of things that often crop up in uh, iterated integrals, as a la Crane and um, Kramer. Oh, uh, I think I'm, I'm losing you. Can you can you say Sorry. again? Uh, these these are the types of things that often crop up in uh, Kramer in work by Kramer and Alan Kahn and these iterative integrals. Is it, to say, is it for the same reason that uh, this works here? Like, um, yeah, no, I don't I think mean, they use this exact symbol, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, so. This, this, this and, and same. They they, yeah, they don't call it, but, but, but I think they mostly investigate scalar. Yes, that's right, right, yeah. That's right, so, so that's new, but I don't think they, uh, yeah, it's similar, but I don't think that's, I, I, I'm, I know there were, but I don't think that's, um, it, 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 have this, it doesn't have it. Have notion of polylogs, but they, they might have studied the, um, the iterated integrals, yeah. But is it, a, is this uh, map to, uh, um, to this tensor product, is that a co-product structure? Yes, it does have a co-product structure. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah. Can you ask, what is the Please. meaning of the tensor product? Max, what is the there. meaning? I mean, yeah, there's some mathematical meaning, but I, I think what for us is just we can we can we can understand the identities from this product very simply, like you see here. Like for this example, we can actually, you know, uh, you know, normally how would you derive such an identity? Well, you write some integral representation, blah blah blah. But here with symbol, you can immediately boom write you know, understand it right away. So that is- But you are not adding, for example, this addition of the two terms on the left-hand side, and you are getting something on the right, but uh, standard tensor product won't do with that equation. Right, but see, the, this is the definition on the next slide. So, so what you do, uh, the, yeah, it's not standard. So, so what you do, the way to define it is as following, you, you take, so, so you define it recursively. So th that's actually on the next um, slide. So you, you, you start with log, right? And then you write Li2 as, you know, whatever integral it is, uh, times d log. So, so you see for, okay, for you, you take the k, um, tk, and you write it as tk minus one d log. And then you state, okay, the symbol of this is the symbol of this times the argument of this. So that's the definition. Yeah, the, the usual way to talk about it for Goncharov would be algebraic K-theory. Uh, do you use this, this language in your papers? Uh, well, you know, we wrote this paper with uh, Goncharov. So, uh, yes, so, so we, we don't use this language in our paper because we, we are practitioners, we are physicists, who uh, we would like to be able to do the computation. So, indeed... So what happened, this is, the history of this work is the following, Gantro was a professor in, in, in Brown, and we we saw this paper with this thousands of you know, terms, 
and a bunch of polylogs in that. So we went to his office and we said, um, hi, my name is such and such. And, and uh, he taught us uh, this symbol and he taught us it's, it's in exactly this way, such that we can go ahead and apply it to, um, to various, um, you know, be able to put it on a computer and, and actually compute. So, so we don't, so, so this is as much as we use for, you, you know, every, everything we use, I think I put on this slide, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So, 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 so I think had we just read his papers, I don't think we would have, <laughs> we would have understood, so first of all, we didn't understand very much. Uh, and we didn't know this technology. So, 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 but, but be, so because he was able to explain to us in such a simple form. So given a function, we can, we know what the symbol is and then we just go and use, uh, you know, properties which, so, so this, this, this actually follows from, from this recursive um, definition. So, um, so we, we, now what we do is, so instead of, so now given a fun, so, so we have this map, given a function, we talk about its symbol. So for example, given, so I, to, I told you, for example, for two loops, we have transcendentality four. So we have leaf four. So we have a four tensor product, for example. So I have not explained to you this arguments yet. So you have to, to wait for the next slide. So uh, what we do, instead of thinking about this function, we think about this sum of these tensor, um, tensor products. And then many terms, and there's certain brackets that appear, which I will, uh, explain to you uh, in the next slide. So, uh, and, and, and so there are certain brackets and there's certain number of them. And that's what we call, mm, I, I'll go uh, next slide. That is what we call the symbol alphabet. So given an amplitude, so instead of talking about, um, you know, the arguments or possibilities, we talk about this um, symbol alphabet and these are the letters. So there are many, many terms, but these letters repeat. So this would be, um, uh, this is something what we call a symbol alphabet. But let me say a few words now. What, so, so that's as far as function goes. So are there any question, more questions on this? So, so, so what we've learned- what, Sorry, what maybe, learned, just, maybe just to ask, when you say you check these things, you have written down 7,272 terms. Are you saying you can, all 7,272 and you compare with the answer? No, no, no. So when I said, uh, you know, for our, for our paper was that, so somebody, so not somebody, Dilduka Dursminov had a formula involving all this Gonchar polylogs. So then we took a symbol of it and we guessed a different function, much simpler function, that, like the one in blue, and, but his, his uh, function did not involve so many terms. It was uh, reduced yeah, yeah, this to- one doesn't, This one doesn't, but let me just okay. say, so this, this one doesn't, in, in written this way. Then for this function, we numerically check that this function is agrees with the other function of uh, Deluca, Dolan, and Smirnoff. Now, there are various ways to write this function. Uh, you know, so, so actually the symbol of it. So, so I, I can, I can um, uh, tell you uh, in, in a little bit. But the most important, yes, if you write them out, there are many, many terms, but they repeat. The, 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 the cross rate, the, not the, the brackets that appear, there's certain, I, I, this is what will be fo focus of my talk, actually. There are only nine of them. And, and that's what, what I'll come in uh, to next. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let me explain to you this, what are these brackets? So what are these brackets? So we normally think about amplitudes as function of you know, momentum. So these are so-called momentum twisters, which were introduced uh, by Penrose actually, and they were extensively used in the work of Arkani Hamed, Bujeli, Kachaz, and Trinker, and Hodges. So uh, I have all the definitions really here. So what, so, so what, so if you have massless momentum P, we can always write it as a product of two uh, spinners, lambda, lambda, tilde. This is called a spinner helicity method. So, um, you know, you can, multi so, so P is lambda lambda tilde, right? Right, uh, how I wrote here, A just labels the, um, so mu is um, zero, one, two, uh, three, and A la labels the number of, of the corresponding uh, particle. So then 
uh, what are these? I, I, I just will t tell you what, the, what these momentum processes are. So then there's something called dual co coordinates, uh, X, uh, and these are related to the so-called dual conformal symmetry. Again, this is a big subject that I'm not covering here, but um, so you can uh, introduce this dual co coordinates PA by these formulas through X. And then you essentially what you do, you, so you go from momentum to this dual X, and then to each point, each point here, you have the corresponding line in P3, essentially, by this formula. So to each point, P, PA, you have ZA now. And Zs are labeled by Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, okay? So to each point, you have this, the, the, this line, and there's a natural SL4C invariant associated with this. We, you just take epsilon i, j, k, l, z, i, z, j, z, k, z, l. And that's, that's what these brackets are. So if you're looking at you know, six points, you have one, two, three, four, two, three, four, uh, five, et cetera, et cetera. So you have all these possible brackets. That's how we label. This is now how we label the momentum. So there's a map from the momentum to these for massless particles. These, these are literally lambda x uh, lambda uh, as written here. So these are called momentum twisters. So every way you'll see these brackets, so the only thing you need to remember that, you know, for endpoints is this, now everything will be in terms of these brackets. So for example, you know, this is what these are right here. And if you look at the full symbol, if you just, you know, they're, they're, so these are the leading transcendentality terms. There's also terms with Li3, log cubed, et cetera. Now, if you take the symbol, there are many, because of cyclicity, there are many, um, many terms you, you start producing. They also are based on relations. Uh, and so this is a full symbol. Now, there are only nine, in general, I think there are more, but only nine letters. So what kind of brackets, we can ask the question, what kind of brackets appear in this symbol? So only nine appear and the ones that are written here. So that's what we call symbol alphabet. And that's something that we will be interested to learn more about uh, uh, momentarily. Okay, so I, I gave you this example, a uh, very well-known example for two loop six point uh, MHV. And I explained to you what the symbol of that amplitude is, and in particular, something called symbol alphabet. So the way the bootstrappers do these computations uh, is the following. So they start, so they do some high, you know, some say six points at some number of loops, suppose, you know, uh, four loops. So they, they take for each element of this tensor product, they take a certain entry that comes from alphabet. So there are many possibilities, of course. And uh, so they take it as a given, this is the symbol. And for each entry of this tensor product, you can have each, each of these uh, letters of the alphabet, okay? So then they impose con certain constraints. So uh, I'm not gonna go into details. So the, 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 the review I quoted, so I took it from the paper and they you know, they set various cons physical constraints, symmetries, collinear limits, uh, you know, multi-regic kinematics, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole program, this series of papers, most, uh, so by, mostly by Lance Dixon and their collaborators. So they start with a symbol and find, uh, you know, using the constraint, they find a unique solution for this uh, symbol. And of course, then there's a more work because from the symbol, you want to be able to write, you want to write a function at the end, you know, you, you, you like, you'd like to have a function. So, and this is how all these computations were done. So in particular, for uh, you know six and seven points high loops, that's uh, that's the methods that um, that were used. Now, so what, is it understood why the why there's a unique solution? I mean, um, uh, right. So uh, I think it's remarkable that they find a unique solution. Right. So so the way they do it, they impose this constraint or that constraint, and at the end they do find a unique solution. And there's a theorem that it must be unique or there's no, it's just an X. It, no, 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 there's no theorem. There, definitely there's no theorem. Uh, the, um, no, definitely. I'm wondering how do, how do they know that it's unique, that they just didn't find one of a set of I think they just, they, 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 they basically have computer codes and then they put like arbitrary coefficients and then they fit. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be 
it's absolutely I, I so 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 there's a whole program that they've been doing for many years you know I I'm not part of um, I, that's not something I do but that's uh, that's uh, yeah I think it's it's quite remarkable they you know they check consistency conditions that uh, you know some of these things uh, I will mention a little bit have been computed by maybe some other methods or you know you want a particular limits collinear limits to work and, and there's something called Steinman relations from the old literature that they use so it's, it's pretty yeah, it's pretty remarkable that it works at all. So yeah, but 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 certainly no for this high loop. Certainly nobody did like the actual computation and said, okay, so this is I computed this you know seven loop integral and look, it agrees with what they what um, what uh, uh, this shows. So that that's not been that. Any other questions? Okay, so. The question I'm interested in, and uh, so 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 this is what I've been working on is how do we know? And so so I gave you this example for six points, right? So there we had full control. You know, uh, the computations of integrals were done, the function was done, everything was well understood. And in general, how do we know? Can we have a mathematical description of what letters to start with? And can we describe in general this symbol alphabet for any n? So that's the question um, uh, I'd like to address. So, and the answer to this would be that for six and seven points, there's a nice mathematical structure called cluster algebra. So these simple entries could be described by a uh, cluster algebra that was introduced by Fomin and Zielinski, 2002, and uh, it grew into an interesting area in mathematics. Uh, so let me just um, tell you the statement maybe about, about this and then uh, say a few words what the cluster algebra is all. So the statement is that this symbol alphabet, these entries, is given by a subset of coordinates for any n, well, for n six and seven, uh, at least uh, a subset of cluster coordinates of Grassmannian cluster algebra, GR4n. So let, let me explain what the cluster algebra is. So the simplest um, uh, example, I'll, I'd like to start with an example of a cluster algebra is called A2. So to define, uh, in general, a cluster algebra, you usually start with um, a quiver. So you draw some dots connected by lines. So in, in, in the case of A2, you start with two dots, A1 and A2, connected by a, uh, by, by a line right here. And given, given the quiver, I'll do this example uh, in, in a sec uh, in details. You can associate, given a quiver, so if you have some kind of quiver like that, you can associate a matrix, basically, which tells you uh, how the uh, arrows go. So the number of arrows from I to J. So IJ entry of the matrix would be the number of arrows from I to J. So for example, you know, uh, here we have an arrow from one to two. So the matrix would be zero, one, minus one, zero. Okay, so then given, so you have a quiver and then you associated a matrix Bij to it. And then you can define something called a mutation rule. At each vertex, you could define a new coordinates by the following general formula. So you define for uh, say uh, K um, for the uh, red one, you could define a new coordinate A prime by a given formula. So for example, for this A2, you have, two nodes to the quiver and the mutation rule would just tell you that it's a recursion in this case a n plus one is one plus a n over a n minus one so you start a one a two then you go to a three is one plus a two over one a one you go to a four and then you go to a five now if you go to a six you can compute you go one plus a five over a four you see uh one plus uh a1 plus A2 uh, cancel, one of A2 is also cancel, and you get back to A1. So, so you go back in the in in you go back uh, in the loop. So these are the only five coordinates for A2 cluster algebra. So I've explained here. Uh, so, so in general, you have this um, arbitrary matrix and you have arbitrary coordinates. And um, you, so, so we can apply those formulas for, a, a, for, for the A2 that I had on the previous page. So for example, again, 
So you use that. So so here I I, I kind of try to use uh, this this more general more general thing to write down a three. So a, a one plus. If you, I apply, I get okay. So this thing is on the way. Is you get one plus a two over a one, etc., etc., etc. So here I just explicitly demonstrated how it works. So that's an a two cluster algebra. Uh, oops, oops. Oh here, yeah. That's an a two uh, cluster algebra. So uh, and in more general, of course, you start with arbitrary quiver. And uh, so I'll go right away, tell you what the Grassmannian cluster algebra is. So the, the cluster algebra that we will use, uh, this, the quiver for it is given by this grid. So ignore for now the things in the, in the brackets, just um, take the grid on uh, three by N minus five matrix like the um, quiver like that with arrows organized in this form. And these are various brackets that we encountered before. And so then, so, so you have this, I, so, so I postulate this, um, I postulate this matrix, oh, uh, sorry, I postulate this quiver. And then I can use the mutation rule in general that I have, that is in definition. By the way, this um, Fomin and Zelvinsky cluster algebra, they, they, they have a portal where they list every single class, every single conference in that. Everything, in, everything you ever wanna know about cluster algebras is, is in this uh, link. Uh, but but um, the most important, so you start with this uh, Grassmannian um, uh, quiver, and then you can go ahead and produce more by a certain rule, okay? So this is called a GR4N cluster algebra. Now, okay, so this is a known things in mathematics. What does this have to do with us? Well, it turns out, and this was observed in our paper with um, uh, you know, Golding on Cheryl's uh, Spradlin and Virgo, it turns out that if you take an A3 cluster algebra, where you take this, where the nodes are, so, so, so for n equals six, I taught you that it's GR46, okay? So if I take A3 now, uh, so, 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 if you, so, so it looks like a Dinkin diagram for an A3, that's why, that's, that's the terminology. And now instead of this four, these brackets with four entries, I take the dual ones, so just, the, the, you know, it's easier to write it like that. So I take the square one, three, one, four, one, five, and then I apply the mutation rules from general uh, definition. Uh, so this, this uh, process, unlike, so for A5, for A2, um, remember there were five different coordinates. So there would be, there were five different quivers. Here there would be uh, so so you apply 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 the rule you you would have fourteen different quivers from you obtain from mutation and then if you see what are the uh, uh, what are the possible set of coordinates that you generated remember how for a two I'm I'm skipping the details but 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 um, you know the process is identical so here you had a one a two one plus a two over a one this and this so you produce the five of these uh, coordinates. So similarly, you would produce here uh, the, uh, all of these. Hmm? So, um, uh, so, 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 so there's something about uh, fix, which I don't wanna go into, but, but these nine, so these nine that you produce, the, the observation we could make that this is exactly the symbol alphabet for any four six amplitudes that I showed you before. Can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. uh, is this algebra finite? Yes, so very important question. So mm -hmm. it turns out for six and seven, it is. So this process stops for, for n, equal, n equals six and n equals seven, but okay. not for n equals eight. That would be very important. Okay, what is the, so, uh, okay. Is it an algebra over complex numbers or what? How do you multiply two elements? These are just ordinary elements. Just it's just a set of coordinates. Just just like um, uh, the way we think of it is just a list of you know various combinations of a one and a two of this form. That's all. But you don't define multiplication or just an ordinary map. Yeah. No. 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 So 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 yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. I have to ask again. You are getting the integrand of planar amplitudes by this method. Okay. But you have to, the first issue is there's an integration to be done and there will be divergences. Okay. So, yeah, yeah so, I, I skipped this important part. Yes. 
So, um, okay, so let, uh, yeah, I did skip this part. So for n equals four young mills theory, yes. So there okay. are divergences, yeah. but the divergences are known to all be in the form of e to the one loop amplitudes times time finite remainder function. Mm -hmm. So what we are looking at as this finite remainder function. Yeah, I should have had a slide on that, but yeah, I didn't. Okay, second question is, what about the analyticity properties in momenta after you integrate? Do they fulfill the, for example, the analyticity properties in the book of Aiden, Pokemon and so forth? Or yes, what? yes, people study this, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what about subtractions? We know that in dispersion relations, in, in uh, scattering theory, the analyticity will not fix the subtractions. Okay? You need asymptotic behavior. So the amplitude, you said something is unique. How can it be unique? Because um, there are all these unknown subtractions that you fix that changes the whole thing because of unitarity. Right, uh, so this was analyzed by Bernd Dixon and others. So I will just refer you to, to their work, yeah. Okay. So they basically analyzed it and and and, and approved, uh, uh, I guess, as much as, you know, I, I would call that maybe not in a mathematician sense, but uh, yeah, so they, 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 there is an organized way to, to deal with the divergences and, and what we are after, when I call, when I say, okay, we are looking at endpoint L loop amplitude, I, I, what I mean is the remainder function, the finite mm -hmm. expression. Okay. okay, so very good. So, okay, so what time is that? Okay, so I should, yeah. okay. Uh, one more small question. Okay. In the integrands of say Feynman amplitudes, there is a notion of reality. If I take a complex conjugation, I get another amplitude. So the issue I'm asking is this algebra you're writing down, is, is there a star defined on it? Is it what? These are just symbols. These symbols are valued in, they're just symbols, but is there a star of the symbol corresponding to complex conjugation? Yeah, there are certain parity symmetry uh, that, that is there. Yeah, I, I'm not mentioning it, but I, yeah, there's certain parity properties. I, I just don't have it on my hand, but, but it's been looked at, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 that's been looked at. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so now, uh, very good. So now, uh, yes, so completely not obvious that, that this procedure of mutation, uh, as was just pointed out, stops and, 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 and you, you don't go uh, forever. So in fact, there's a theorem which I didn't write, but I should have. So if you have a quiver, so you have a, some kind of quiver, then you mutate, you get some other, you, you know, uh, you mutate, you get some other quiver. So if you, through this process, get something which looks like ADE Dinkin diagram, then uh, this is a finite algebra. So there's a, it, there's a theorem by Fomin and Zelivinsky. And for the case of that I showed you for A3, yes, it's finite. If you go to a, to a seven point, so for seven points, you start, as I uh, explained here, you start, so for uh, any n, right, you do four n. So you do always three by, um, by n minus uh, five. So you had three by one, now we have three by two, right? So we, you have uh, three by two quiver. So it turns out that actually through mutation, this quiver could be shown to be that of E6. So also finite. So I can play the same game with this quiver. So just ignore what, what is in the boxes. I don't want to go into the, the details. But basically, these are called frozen nodes, and uh, one doesn't mutate um, on them. But maybe for this discussion, not, not so important. But so, so, so the, the, the main point is you start with this quiver, and then you mutate. And this process, uh, you, you, you know, uh, instead of uh, 514, you, you, get high, you get 833 here. You get this many quivers and you get uh, this many coordinates. You get 35 um, kind of pluca coordinates of P on P3, IJKL, seven coordinates of this form where these uh, brackets are now, so, so we have these four brackets, four brackets A, B, C, D, and there are these corresponding intersections uh, of this form. So, so there's seven of these, um, seven because there's plus cyclic, uh, or, or, or another seven of this form, so plus cyclic, that's always seven. So, so we would, so, so again, the process, this is, this is a math statement. We have this quiver, we mutate, we get a list of coordinates. 
So the non-trivial observation is that that exactly matches the symbol alphabet for n equals seven amplitude. So that was a non-trivial observation in this paper. So the seven point amplitude was first computed by Karan Huat. And then the very non-trivial observation uh, by us was that this exactly, uh, the symbol alphabet for that amplitude exactly is described by this uh, E6 cluster algebra. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the statement. Uh, any questions? Because I'm going to move to uh, more recent work now. Any questions? So the just the uh, these statements are all associated with the planar limit, the large n limit of that. Absolutely. This okay. is large n, n equals four. In particular, we after this remainder function. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? So, so basically what I've described so far is kind of like, uh, you know, been, been in the literature for a long time. I just want to say a few words what the issues have been and what partial progress we've made. Okay, so it turns out, so, we, so you see it took 10 years to go from n equals seven to n equals eight. So Caron Huot wrote his result in uh, 2010. And then there was this work by Zhang Li and he, Song He and his students, uh, uh, <coughs> 2020, where they first wrote the sim So these are the amplitudes, the computations from the physics. And okay, again, I'm not describing these brackets. I actually had a note that I should add that, but I, I, I didn't. But okay, so these, you can ask, what are these bars? The bars are uh, like four bars, like three, four, five and the intersection are certain. So, so what these things are, are something similar to some, some algebraic expression in, in the original bracket. So they encoded by this, uh, by this. So, but the important point is that, so this, uh, this, these are the amplitudes computations that were done recently. And so, so they're rational, kind of rational types of coordinates where you know, these are just some rational functions of um, some polynomials of, of brackets. And then there are 18 additional letters containing square roots. So these were the new, um, uh, so this is a new computation and two new things appear. And uh, let me just tell you a little bit what's been um, done. So uh, as I already said, uh, for GR48, it turns out that the cluster algebra becomes infinite dimensional. So what I showed you for six and seven, where it stops at you know, 14 and 833 quivers, this continues on. So it's not, you can't just use cluster algebra to say, okay, these are gonna be my letters um, for eight points. Let me go try bootstrapping it. Um, instead, uh, you, you, you're kind of not, not sure what to do. Uh, and then the second thing is that the square roots appear. So that's not normally what we see in cluster coordinates. So, so these are the new features. So these amplitudes were computed and the, this, this is the new symbol that, that was obtained. Now, uh, can we understand this from mathematics and what, what can describe these? So there's been several approaches to this. So there was, um, uh, I, I'm not uh, a great expert in, in the first uh, two. I'll just say uh, roughly what they do in my understanding of the situation. So. Uh, there was work by Dramon Forster Gudagan and Calusius who uh, were able to uh, explain this alphabet from, from something called tropical geometry. And then there was a dual polytop uh, work by Arkani Hamid Lam and uh, Spradlin. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what uh, we've done because we tried to get this alphabet from Plavi graphs. Uh, we have some results, but no systematics. So let me just quickly say a little bit what is this tropical geometry? So tropical is pr process of tropicalization is when you replace multiplication by addition and addition by a minimum. And there was this important work by Spey and Williams, mathematicians in 2003, who associated a fan to the positive Grassmannian by solving tropicalized blue correlations. So you take your blue some you know, blue correlations are based on relations, you uh, apply the operation trop to it. And you get some, you, you get some, uh, uh, you get some collection of rays, and and you can analyze this uh, this uh, polytop. So what this uh, group uh, in Southampton uh, by James Drummond and uh, his um, postdocs uh, did, 
they uh, didn't look at all clupa relations, but only a, su a subset. And they were able to uh, write down the corresponding rays to this polytope using these techniques of Spey and Williams. Now, I didn't, I didn't say this, but to each cluster coordinate, there's some, there's a association, something, I, I, I don't want to go because it's not so important. There's something called G vector that you can associate to, which is a one-to-one -one map to each uh, cluster coordinate. And it turns out that from this construction, they got all the rational N equals eight letters that we saw on the previous slide. In addition, there were two others, kind of exceptional rays. And they basically had some process that uh, you can reach those by repeatedly mutating on, on these kinds of quivers. Th th this is basically a quiver that you can get from mutating, uh, fr from starting with GR48 and, and, uh, and mutating. And uh, remarkably, they were able to reproduce precisely the ETN letters involving square roots. So it's a very technical uh, work. Uh, I'll just, uh, hopefully I gave you some flavor of it. Uh, then there was this paper by Akani Hamid Lamas Fradlin, where they looked at a very complicated math construction. I, I don't really um, uh, know much about it, but there was this work by mathematicians who have uh, some methods of um, uh, compute variables associated to the exceptional race. They use this other method and they were basically had some evidence to reproduce um, these square roots. Okay, so what is that we did? So we did something different. So it turns out, uh, so there was this uh, work and there's a book now by Arkani Hamid, Bujeli, Kachazo, Gancho, Fosik, and Trincom, where they claim that the leading singularities of endpoint amplitudes could be described by this following integrals. So it's an integral over the Grassmannian, some Cs. So, and in fact, there's some delta function C time. So these are the momentum twisters we had and C I will describe momentarily. So essentially what we've done, we've analyzed all of these graphs. So, so for, the, for each C, one can associate something called a plavic graph. So, so, if you have a, so if you have a plavic graph, which is, so, so the graphs, the plavic graphs are, you know, planar bicolor graphs where you have uh, white and black nodes and they have some equivalence relations like moves and, you know, there's some rules how to work with them. Most notably, there's a mathematical, most importantly, there's a mathematical package where you fix a certain number, uh, you, you know, depending on the graph you are interested in, which could just spit for you the matrix C, okay? And you, in, in this formula, you basically integrate over all possible Cs. So you have a graph, you have Cs. So what we've done, we took, we looked at the class of graphs. We don't have systematics, we're working on this. So we would like to systematically understand the following. Can we take, what graphs do we take? Solve C times Z equals zero. So Cs are from the graph, so they, and, 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 and then you solve this for Z and hopefully reproduce the symbol alphabet. That's what, that's the problem, uh, you know, we work with extensively exploring. So let me just say, give you an example. So for example, you take a graph like that, you label this, you can label it by faces and edges. So it spits for you C, and then you solve C times Z. So Z1, you know, uh, through uh, Z6. And that's what, that's what you get for these Fs. So you, you solve, for, for them. And then, then you analyze what are the possible brackets that appear, right? And you do get all the symbol letters for six points. So then, then you know, we, so for six points, we understand it very well. These are the only graphs that, that appear. And um, so, and uh, we indeed get, you know, corresponding to each graph, we get, we get a corresponding uh, cluster coordinates labeled by these quivers. Now for, um, Seven, yeah, I should have had the rushing. For seven points, there's also the same thing. You can reproduce all rational letters uh, through this um, process. Uh, but the non-trivial thing was the eight points where we were, we were really excited because we just, you know, we just took these graphs and um, uh, for eight points and we got the square roots without tropical geometry, without dual polydops, without any of these complicated things. So we, yeah, we've been pretty excited by that. 
Um, so yes, uh, eight uh, works and we can get both rational letters and square roots. And this is actually work in progress that um, I think um, soon will appear within next month. So there's also been um, a computation of N equals nine symbol alphabet by Song He and uh, his group. And uh, you know, there are a certain number of square roots and there's a certain number of rationals. And I think we have, at least we have right now the graphs which reproduce the correct alphabet, but we would really like to understand more about systematics. So we, we haven't you know, solved it, but we've made, made progress. So, but uh, again, for, from the amplitude sides, I, I showed you the end point, uh, the eight point alphabet, but also then the nine point. So th this is actually, I should have said, this is work in progress. We also have another paper coming on, uh, there, there's some other, so that's actually a little bit orthogonal. There's something, some other construction cluster. So maybe we've been reading cluster literature and trying to understand what can be applicable. The, there's also something called tensor diagrams, yet we don't quite understand yet what their relation with Blavik's story is. And we have some kind of way to reproduce N equals eight and N equals nine letters uh, from it as well. Yeah, so, so it's an interesting story. So it's very interesting mathematics. It's, um, so we have, we take the results from physics and try to, uh, to, to understand it. I, I think there's still a lot uh, more to be learned, but let me just conclude by just summarizing what I said. So I've, we've discussed the uh, uh, planar N equals four young mills uh, scattering amplitudes. I showed to you that uh, uh, the uh, symbol alphabet for these uh, amplitudes for six and seven points can be described by a GR for N cluster algebra. And starting with N equals eight, we need a new mechanism producing finite subsets in GR for N. Uh, and uh, we need a new mechanism to produce the square roots. And we studied a candidate uh, for this. And, um, you know, future, there's, there's still more to be done. So it would be nice. Uh, to have this more systematically, study more examples. I didn't mention at all. Uh, so uh, th there's also important work in cluster adjacency. It turns out that um, this, you, you can ask when can two entries, um, when can two brackets appear next to each other in a symbol? And it turns out that there's a notion of cluster adjacency that that's possible when they these two appear in the same quiver. And there's some work analyzing this uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, there's also some work, uh, you know, given a symbol, you have to still to write down a function. And this also has been, you know, explored by Dixon and others. So more in that, and, and you know, the fact that this function depend only on this particular cluster variables imposes some constraint. So th there's a lot more to be done. And of course, recently there was also a very good work by um, Johannes Hinn uh, showing some of this cluster structure for just Feynman, regular Feynman diagrams, no one equals four. So I think there's more to be understood there too. So I think I'll stop here and take questions. Uh, well, thank you very much for, uh, for a comprehensive talk on, on this. And I'm sure there are lots of questions. The floor is open to questions, okay. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. And uh, in the beginning, you said that one expects new difficulties uh, for n equals 10 because elliptic polylogs uh, will come into the game. Uh, has that been explored already or is that for the future? Yes, this has been not explored not by me, by several groups. So uh, no, most notably Claude Dur. Uh, Johannes Brodel and Jake Bugelli, so several groups, and they actually have even in their meeting. So they, there are even notions, uh, several technical papers, generalizing symbol, for example, for those class of functions. So yeah, there's a series of papers in, in that direction already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I ask, um, I, I don't really have any feeling for the physical structure of the amplitudes. Um, is, is, is there any sign of, of, say, for example, a resonance if there's bound states or something? Uh, these are n equals four. Yeah, I, I guess we're just looking at these entries. Yeah, I don't have a good answer to your question.
Any other questions? Okay. I'm afraid the, uh, the public graphs went a little bit too quick for me. Um, can you tell me a little bit more how, how they work or where, where, what was the origin of these? Where did they crop up in the literature before you? Well, the most notably, them? yeah. So most notably they came from, right. So the, the best paper is this. It just okay. gives you uh, rules and that's what we use. But most notably this book, um, so uh, I think it came in mathematics from the book of Posnikov, who is a mathematician at MIT. And that's where, uh, you, you know, this book has a, you know, plabic graph. So, so uh, on, on the cover page, uh, that's been basically, I mean, the main statement is this that I, I, I've written here. And the, the, a lot of the properties, I mean, it's a whole book. So, but the main thing I would recommend this book, yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? Well, uh, one, one uh, more or less personal question I also asked uh, Dirk Grimer when, when he talked. Uh, he mentioned uh, the same book by, by Eden and Olive and so on. And I was a bit interested because that was essentially the first quantum field theory book I, I looked at. And of, I couldn't make much out of it. But uh, Dirk Grimer said there, there's still uh, uh, it turned out that uh, though S matrix formalism had, had been forgotten, uh, there were still quite a number of ideas uh, uh, laying around in, uh, in this book and it was for him worthwhile uh, to read it. Uh, uh, did, did you profit from this book since you showed it? Yes, I, I did. Um, in fact, uh, I, I think there's several people in our, you know, younger people in our community who are benefiting dramatically by studying this book and applying this in the new context. So one thing that I personally benefit is the notion of Landau singularities. I didn't talk about that, but uh, you know, uh, the, these Feynman diagrams, you, you can, you know, talk about Landau singularities and their, you know, all their descriptions. So that, that's what, for example, the part of the book that I read there, so. Thank you. But, but there's, certain num there's certain number of young people who, I think um, made a good progress in their careers by um, by studying, uh, and, and they know much more, yeah, than me. But uh, I, I think uh, it's kind of, yeah. But 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 as I said, we can say why wasn't this done before? Well, this is n equals four. This was uh, uh, not there at a the time, and there are new insights such as symbols, such as the momentum twister variables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. So uh, it is like using new insight together with the old uh, work, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other last questions? Well, if not, I will stop the record. I will thank um, Anastasia again and uh, stop the recording. We can be less formal, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your talk and